I do some consulting work on American The feeling in the room was you probably... Don't ever say to her that her point about the shower coins. She doesn't have any discussion on the ethical we laugh. Laugh. more of a community. We're trying to back up her. doing in autism. Flint Leverett served at the National Security Council, State Department, and CIA, and is currently a professor of international affairs at Penn State. He and his wife, Hillary Mann Leverett, co-authored the controversial book, Going to Tehran, Why the United States Must Come to Terms with the Islamic Republic of Iran. We'll talk with him about what he calls the myth of Iranian irrationality, about why he thinks U.S. policy toward Iran must change, and about what it will take to avoid war. Here's our conversation with Flint Leverett. Flint Leverett, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. To put it mildly, uh, Going to Tehran is a bold, urgent book, and you wrote it with your wife, Hillary Mann Leverett, yes. uh, who also served at the National Security Council. Um, what was the impetus for writing this book? After we left government, well, I should maybe talk about the circumstances under which we left government. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Um, we left the White House um, literally about two weeks before the invasion of Iraq started and the timing of our departure wasn't coincidental. We, we thought that the Iraq war was going to be a major strategic error for the United States, that it would end up making the United States much weaker, certainly in the, in the Middle East, potentially globally. Um, nothing that's happened in the intervening decade has made me reconsider that, um, that judgment. And one of the things that, that struck us as we were inside government at the White House watching this unfold and not really being able to do much to, to stop it. Um, all of the institutions that Americans are supposed to rely on to be a check on bad policy ideas, to ask the hard questions, Congress, the media, um, think tanks, public intellectuals, with a few very honorable, even courageous exceptions, most of those institutions rolled over for the um, invasion of Iraq. They never really Why do really you suppose challenged. they rolled over? Um, I think that there's a certain element of just political cravenness in the aftermath of 9-11. No one really wanted to challenge um, the Bush administration. But I think it goes beyond that. I think in the end, most of, uh, most American elites, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, they have bought into the ideology or the mindset which also motivated the Bush administration. I mean, the Bush administration did, took some things in directions where perhaps it hadn't gone quite so far um, before, but the basic idea, the basic model for the Bush administration's foreign policy is something that post-Cold War administrations, whether Democratic or Republican, have bought into. And I think that that's what the real problem is, that they basically buy this idea that America is supposed to be a hegemonic power, that it can be and is supposed to be a hegemonic power. And that's what we saw no one being really willing to, to challenge. And so after we were out of government and we became more and more focused in our own research and writing on Iran, U.S. policy toward Iran, we could see this was going to be the next crisis, if you will, in, in the Middle East. And we were determined that this time around, there was going to be somebody who was asking the hard questions and making the kinds of countervailing arguments that should have been made before the invasion of Iraq, but to a large extent weren't. Well, uh, and the book does that. And, and what I think is interesting about the book is that several years earlier, you had written an op-ed piece that w couldn't be published. Uh, th didn't the Bush administration oh, it, it, stop you from it publishing? It was published. This okay, was, but yes. very similar uh, in theme to your book. Yes, in uh, 2006, at the end of 2006, this was actually um, the first piece that my wife and I wrote, wrote jointly. Uh, it was an op-ed for the New York Times. It was based to a large extent on a larger monograph that I had published a few weeks before. As a former CIA official, um, I had an obligation to submit things that might pertain to um, anything I'd worked on in government. Um, and I had, I had done that um, from the time I left government in 2003, submitted you know, everything from a book manuscript to lots of op-eds and shorter pieces. 
And the agency on its own had never changed a word. Everything, I know, I wasn't revealing classified material, go ahead and publish. But in this 2006 op-ed, um, the White House was beginning not to like the policy argument that we were making about Iran. And so um, even though the agency cleared it and said there's no classified material here, the White House inserted itself into the clearance process, said we insist that we also have to clear on this and we want the following passages taken out. The pa it, was, it was absurd. None of the passages contained classified information. It talked about our dialogue with Iran over Afghanistan and al-Qaeda after 9-11, things that Secretary Powell had talked about in public, others had talked about in public. And so we asked the New York Times if they would do this, and they agreed. Um, we published it with the blacked out passages that with the White House had lines. insisted on. And then we wrote a precede, which the Times also published, that said everything that the White House has insisted on blacking out is in the public domain. This is an inappropriate um, exercise. And if you want to know what's in the blacked out passages, go to these things I've already written, go to this testimony by Secretary Powell. We just basically said, go look in these things and you'll know what's in the blacked out passages. And so the effort really was to stop you in your tracks. Yeah. I'm curious to know what impact your book has had, and, and I ask that because it makes me think of Jimmy Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, mm -hmm. uh, which a number of people hailed it as, as a courageous book, uh, but a much bigger group of people uh, criticized it as, as being, in, in some cases, anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. um, reaction to, to going to Tehran has been very, very polarized. Um, either either people, um, I mean, really do say very laudatory things about it, talk about it as a, as a courageous, important book, um, or else they don't just criticize it, they talk about it as in some way almost an, an evil or morally uh, deformed um, exercise. And, you know, there's very little uh, kind of tepid reaction in the, in the middle. Uh, most of the reaction is very, very polarized. <laughs> Which is exactly what American politics are today, that polarized. A and you and your wife wrote this uh, almost as a desperate last attempt to prevent a war with Iran. Um, I, I, I think that is an important part of our motivation. We are on a trajectory with Iran where if, if the United States does not decide to change course, um, then I think we are headed toward another U.S.-initiated war in the Middle East. Our position in the Middle East is in free fall. We have had disastrous wars and occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan that have eviscerated the legit perceived legitimacy of American purposes for most of the people that live in the region. We've had a war on terror that we've conducted in a way that has alienated deeply most of the Muslim world. Um, in that sort of environment, if the United States once again launches a war against another Middle Eastern country to disarm it of weapons of mass destruction it does not have in the current climate with regional publics, with public opinion mattering more than ever, the blowback to the U.S. position in the Middle East will be disastrous. It will make the damage done by the Iraq War look almost trivial by comparison. And yes, we are trying to stop that. You say four nuclear weapons Iran does not have. And most people who are, are uh, rattling sabers say the, the goal here is to prevent them from getting it. Um, you know, th there is a way of, of preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons. It's called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. What these people are actually trying to get Iran to do is to surrender something that it is perfectly entitled to do as a sovereign state and as a signatory of the NPT, which is to enrich uranium under international safeguards. You say on their own territory, as you said, with Yes, with, with, with international safeguards. safeguards. They have a right to do that. What we are asking for is not that they not build nuclear weapons because they're not building nuclear weapons. What we're asking them to do is to surrender 
the right to an indigenous nuclear fuel cycle. Why and are they won't you, do that. Why are you so sure that they want to enrich uranium for purely peaceful purposes? Because there's no evidence to the contrary. Now, I mean, I can't obviously offer any guarantees to what any country is going to do in the future, but you can look at what they've done up until this point. There has been no diversion of nuclear materials. They're not enriching anywhere close to weapons grade. They, I think there is a consensus of elite opinion in Iran that even obtaining a small nuclear arsenal would actually leave Iran worse off in terms of security, not better. And both Imam Khomeini, the Islamic Republic's founding father, and the current leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, have said repeatedly that nuclear weapons violate Islamic law. They violate Islamic morality. Now, you can say that's just talk. But there's an important historical precedent where the Islamic Republic didn't just talk the talk, they walked the walk on You're this. You're talking about the war with the Iraq. The war with Iraq, where for years Iraq is regularly using chemical weapons against not just Iranian military targets, but against civilian targets. And the United States is systematically blocking any action in the Security Council um, against Iraq for using chemical weapons um, on the Islamic Republic. The Iranian military leadership comes to Imam Khomeini uh, in the middle of the war and says, look, we inherited from the Shah the capacity to mass produce chemical weapons agent. We need to do this, weaponize it, and be able to retaliate in kind. And with the Iranian people being regularly subjected to chemical weapons attack, Imam Khomeini in the middle of the war said no, because this would violate Islamic morality. The Islamic Republic will not do this. Now, the interesting thing about this, the, the story you just shared right there is that most Americans have never heard that. Yeah. And you say that that's because Iran is being misrepresented in the Western media. By and large, I think that's right. Um, I think that there is a series of myths that shape the American narrative about Iran. And for the most part, media coverage buys into and perpetuates those myths. The myths are that the Islamic Republic is irrational, that it's this immature, ideologically driven polity that can't think about its foreign policy or national security in terms of material national interests. And so the idea of doing real diplomacy, serious engagement with it, that's just not possible. It is supposedly hell-bent on Israel's destruction, implacably anti-American, all of this. But uh, Ahmadinejad has said, for instance, in his uh, speech in New York City when he was invited by Columbia University, mm -hmm. uh, he said that Israel should be wiped off the map. What he, what he said was is that the phrase that he uses in, in, in Farsi is that it should disappear or vanish from the page of time or the page of history. Um, if you look at very carefully at Ahmadinejad's speech, his speeches of other Iranian leaders who've talked about Israel, there's no doubt Iranian elites think that Israel is an illegitimate state. They think it is basically an apartheid-like state. And, but their argument is that in the 21st century, an apartheid-like state can't last forever. And when they talk about how Israel is going to disappear from the page of history, the page of time, they talk about it like the Soviet Union disappeared or like apartheid South Africa disappeared as a result of its own internal contradictions, not because Iran or anyone else waged an aggressive war against it. Now, I understand that's not a comforting scenario for Israelis or for friends of Israel, but it's not a threat to wipe Israel off the map. It's a saying that this is what is going to happen to Israel as it persists on its current trajectory. If I'm reading you correctly, uh, Israel is pushing the United States to establish this red line. And in mm -hmm. fact, President Obama, in a recent speech, promised uh, to defend Israel basically with all of its might. But how important is this red line? And, and what happens when the red line keeps moving? Well, I th and the know, red line, we should say, is the point at which the U.S. will take action. Yes. And, and the Israelis want to have this line very clearly defined 
and as, stated publicly. And stated publicly as when, it, as when Iran reaches a certain level of development in its uranium enrichment capability. And, um, you know, I think that's really very telling because it, it, there is this notion, Israeli officials use it in public a lot, that Iran is, a nuclear Iran would be an existential threat to Israel. That's just nonsense. And even a lot of Israeli officials, the former defense Why minister, Ehud, because if you actually talk to Israeli national security professionals, they acknowledge, in many cases, they've acknowledged publicly on the record that even if Iran did have a nuclear weapon, you know, that they're not, in fact, crazy. They're not going to use it against Israel because they know what would happen a few hours later. We have 70 times the, the military and, and might of not against the And certainly not against the United States. What worries the Israelis, Barack and other um, uh, military and defense officials in Israel have been very explicit about this. What concerns the Israelis is they have a national security strategy that is predicated on their ability to use force first, basically whenever and wherever in the region they want for whatever purpose they deem necessary and whatever amount they deem necessary. And the problem with an Iran that has a certain level of even just latent nuclear capability, you know, the ability to enrich uranium, which could in theory get translated into, into weapons grade material. The problem with that, Barack has said this explicitly on the record, that the problem is the next time Israel thinks it needs to reinvade Gaza or reinvade southern Lebanon, it might have to think twice about it. Doesn't mean, according to Barack, they won't do it, but the decision making would become more complicated. Now, that is not an existential threat. And I think for the Israelis to keep insisting on a kind of unrealistic red line, which is not grounded in any sort of international legitimacy, but is grounded in their you know, strategic comfort, their strategic preferences. You know, for the United States to attach its own policy to that, we are really courting disaster. Now, you have called uh, President Bush, uh, you have charged him with strategic malpractice. Yes. And, of course, have been highly critical of his use of uh, the axis of evil in, in describing Iran or yes. uh, a, a tyranny, a uh, tyrannical outpost. Um, but you say Obama's policies are practically indistinguishable from Obama, uh, from I, Bush's. I, I think in some ways they're they're worse, and, and it, worse in particular in that um, I mean Bush never tried engagement with Iran. He basically insisted on such conditions before he would agree to engage diplomatically with Iran. I mean, af I mean, after Iran helped us enormously after 9-11, helped us against Al-Qaeda, helped us in Afghanistan. Bush refused to engage with them on the nuclear issue, labeled them part of the axis of evil, and said US, the United States will not participate in nuclear talks with Iran until basically Iran surrendered everything that the talks would have been about. Okay, so Bush didn't really engage on the nuclear issue. Obama comes in and he says he's going to engage, but, and now he says, well, I've tried engagement and it, hasn't worked, which is already starting to discredit the possibility of engagement in many people's uh, minds. But what's so terrible about that is he says that he has tried and failed when he hasn't really seriously tried. He has never been willing to He's depart. been highly criticized for saying that he would even talk with Iran. Yes, and but, you know, t talking isn't going to do it. You have to be willing to engage and accept the Islamic Republic as an enduring political entity that is representing legitimate national interests, including a right to safeguarded enrichment. Obama has never been willing to acknowledge Iran's right to enrich. He's never been willing to accept. Is, is the, the Islamic rest of the world uh, willing to uh, accept Iran's right to enrich? Other than Britain, France, Israel, and the United States, yes. The basically the whole non-aligned movement. The non-Western world is prepared to accept it. Russia and China are prepared to accept it. Brazil and South Africa, two countries that are kind of non-proliferation poster children, countries that gave up nuclear weapons programs after democratization, in South Africa's case, gave up eight nuclear weapons that Israel had helped the apartheid regime build. These countries are absolutely adamant in defending their own rights to an indigenous 
nuclear fuel cycles safeguarded, and they are absolutely um, consistent in defending Iran's right to do that. Yes, the people who are not willing to accept Iran's right to enrich the United States, Britain, France, and Israel. You, you say the real problem is that what the United States wants or what the West wants is Iran to become a Western-style democracy. In the end, we, we, we don't like the idea of an Islamic Republic. It makes no sense to Americans who come out of a very different sort of historical and philosophical experience. Um, and, and we just can't accept that a political order that wants to combine participatory politics and elections with principles and institutions of Islamic governance and a strong commitment to foreign policy independence um, can actually be legitimate. But, you know, don't look just at Iran. As the Arab Spring has unfolded, what you see, or in, or in Turkey, what you see is every time Muslim populations in the Middle East get a chance to vote on what kind of political order, political future they want, they vote for some version of this, that they want participatory politics, they want elections, they want to say, but, but, but they want it in you, an Islamic right, but, framework. But, but many say, as you know, that they aren't fair elections. 2009, for example, there are many who would say, yeah, 95% voted, but were they really voting it was their 85%, free will, or 85%? Yeah. Um, you know, it, we have gone into this at such great length in the, in, in the book. Every methodologically serious poll done in Iran before or after the 2009 election, including polls done by very, very reputable Western polling groups, show that Ahmadinejad's re-election with just over 60 percent of the vote, which is what the official results say he got, was eminently plausible. And neither Mir Hussein Musavi nor anyone in his campaign nor anyone in his else challenger. ever showed any kind of credible evidence of fraud, even though given the way the election was conducted, with Musavi having more than 40,000 observers at polling stations and counting places all over Iran, it would have been very easy for him to document where there were cases of fraud because that year for the first time, the Interior Ministry published online the results from every single polling station, 45,000 polling stations all over Iran, they published vote counts from every so single one. you think it's one. legitimate? I'm saying I've seen, I'm not the Iranian election commissioner, I am saying I have seen no credible, serious evidence of fraud. One of the things that struck me uh, powerfully was uh, an interview you did with anti-war radio uh, Scott Horton in, back in December of 2012, and you said that the Islamic Republic has never used weapons of mass destruction. You talked about that just a moment ago, and that uh, literally never there has never been an Iranian suicide bomber. The first modern suicide bomber that I'm reading about was in 1980, a 13-year-old uh, boy who ran in front of an Iraqi truck and blew himself up and he became a hero in Iran. He's memorialized in a suicide, um, a martyrdom museum in Iran, if what I'm watching is correct. Well, but, no, but if you're, I mean, what depends on your definition of suicide bombing. If what you're talking about is somebody who's engaged in, in combat, uh, uh, you know, against an invading force, um, and, and, you know, military mili to military uh, uh, combat, then, okay, yes, there were Iranians who fought in the war against the Iraqi invasion, you know, who gave their lives, you know, who did things on the battlefield knowing that that would result in their, in their deaths. Um, you know, those typically aren't counted as suicide bombers. Suicide bombing is something that happens, you know, basically during an occupation. And, you know, basically because Iran's never been occupied under the Islamic Republic, there haven't been suicide, there's been no Iranian suicide bomber. I mean, that, that figure comes from the most comprehensive study of suicide terrorism yet done by researchers at the University of Chicago and the U.S. Um, I, Air I War College. What you would like to see happen is uh, uh, the precedent you say has been made yeah. when, when Nixon and Kissinger uh, reversed policy with China after 20 years. 
Yeah. You think the same thing should happen with Iran after 30 years of, of a policy that has basically uh, economically uh, and politically isolated Iran. It's, it's the only way to avoid disaster and is manifestly in American interest to do it. You know, for 20 years after the Chinese Revolution, after the communist victory in the, in the Chinese Civil War, the founding of the People's Republic, we refused to recognize the People's Republic diplomatically. We tried to strangle it economically. We didn't just pursue regime change against the People's Republic. We recognized this whole political, other political structure based on Taiwan as the quote unquote real government of China. The results were disastrous for the American position in Asia. I mean, we, among other things, we wouldn't have been in this disastrous draining quagmire, the Vietnam War, without this really ill considered posture toward the People's Republic of China. When Nixon came to office in 1969, he understood this had to change. And so he basically, by accepting this rising revolutionary power as an enduring entity reflecting, representing real legitimate national interests and coming to terms with it, he saved the American position in Asia. We need to do that in the Middle East today. The way to do that is by coming to terms with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Flint Leverett, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Flint Leverett. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find an excerpt from Going to Tehran. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.